Anytime there's a new controversial issue, I ask myself, what have applied ethicists said about this? And bam, look what I found. An ontological argument against face masks by Michael Kowalik. Kowalik argues, and by the way, ontological just means a thing's essential nature. And the two concepts we're looking at here that we do want to get to the heart of or the bottom of would be both our self-identity and also our connection with broader humanity. Qualic argues that our self-identity is reflexive. That is, we can't think of ourselves and understand who we are without considering the way that others see us. And so I think of my, my different roles as a husband, as a father, as a professor, as a soccer coach. Qualic says that I can't really have a concept of who I am in those different roles and who I am overall without considering the way that my wife views me and the look on her face. The way that my kids view me, the look on their faces, the way my students view me, the look on their faces, the same for my soccer players. Qualic argues that seeing those, those facial expressions where it's, whether it's a look of excitement or love or disgust or whatever, that's essential to my interpretation of how they view me and essential, in turn, to the way that I view myself. It's also the case that I need to see the expressions on their faces in order to connect with humanity more broadly. He argues that to the extent that we're covered up like this, we can't really tell if a person is pleased with us, is mad at us, if they share our, our excitement or our disgust. And so this breaks down that essential connection with other persons. And to the extent that we're motivated to wear masks in order to protect humanity, to protect our fellow citizens or our fellow persons, of uh, citizens of the world, to the extent that that's our motivation, and to the extent that doing this distances ourselves from everyone else and breaks down that connection with broader humanity, well then, wearing a mask is self-defeating. If your initial motive is to help and protect others and prevent them from being harmed, and then you do something that diminishes your care for them, your connection with them, well, that's a contradictory position to take. Kowalik cites some experiments where mothers refuse to reciprocate the facial expression, expressions of their infants. And so usually a baby will go, ah, to their mom, and their mom will go, ah, in, the, in return. Or a baby will frown like this at their dad, and their dad might frown like that in return. Or the baby might laugh, and everybody else laughs, because that's one of the most awesome things in the world when a baby laughs. But in this experiment, the baby, the infant, was with their primary caregiver, in this case their mother, and the mother refused to reciprocate those facial expressions. And here's what happened. An infant, quote, an infant, when faced with an expressionless mother, makes repeated attempts to get the interaction into its usual reciprocal pattern where they share their, their facial expressions back and forth. When these attempts fail, the infant withdraws and orients his face and body away from his mother with a withdrawn, hopeless facial expression. Qualic uses this as evidence to show that we need that reciprocity it's not even necessarily approval from your loved ones or just from other people. We just need to see how they're seeing us so that we can change our behavior accordingly and feel that connection with them. And then we can do the same with our facial expressions. But, oh, and also consider examples of older children. Think of someone that you know who's been habitually bullied, whether physically or emotionally or simply ostracized. They may have started out socially flourishing like everyone else, but to the extent that they were continually ostracized and singled out, they probably became more and more withdrawn and depressed. This hindered their emotional and their social development. The same would be true of adults who are ostracized for whatever reason. They become alone and sad and depressed. They are disconnected from the rest of humanity. And so Kowalik uses that and uses this this example to say that, look, if you're wearing a mask to, prevent the re to protect the rest of humanity, this is going to diminish your connection with humanity, and, and so therefore this is self-defeating. A couple of key quotes. Imagine a world without faces. Inhabitants of such a world could not possibly develop language, meaning, or purpose because they would lack a discernible unified likeness to kind, that connection with other persons. Relating face-to-face -face is a condition of ethical intuition. By relating to others in a way that is phenomenally inconsistent with or degraded from what we are innately programmed to detect as human likeness, we are distorting or degrading our own innate sense of self, our humanity, which is not individually self-sufficient, but socially reflexive. If without face-to-face -face relations we are not human, and given that humanity is the basis of all our value commitments, then without it, nothing has value 
or value-oriented purpose. And the closer, here's the last sentence, quote, if my argument is correct, then face mask mandates ought to be urgently abolished on the grounds that they are universally harmful to human agency and therefore inhumane. Recording a video in the rain may also be inhumane. But we're going to do it anyway. All right, here's some responses to Qualic. Response number one could be that I can still express myself somewhat through my eyes, the windows to the soul. So uh, I could probably do a, a rock-like smolder with my eyes. You don't need to see the rest of my face. Or I could do this, and you can see my ever-wrinkling forehead and my eyes. There's some excitement. Or maybe I wink at you, and you <laughs> wink at my wife anyway, and she can get something from that. So it's not like I can't express myself at all if this part of my face is covered up. Also, I have my voice. Yeah, we can express so much through our voice. And also our body language. Whether we're standoffish or welcoming, can't be as welcoming, I suppose, with uh, virus restrictions and whatnot. But there are other ways to convey ourselves and to share that humanity and make that, com that connection. Further, masks are usually only helpful indoors. And so if you're outside, at least with what I understand of the current uh, variants of the, uh, the virus, you don't need a mask in most cases if you're outdoors, unless you're just tightly packed on top of, of, uh, of one another. So you have those opportunities, even for school kids or workers. You can take a break and go outside. Kids go outside for playtime, uh, for whatever recreation. They can take their mask off. Further, you go home. You're with your family unit. Now you can take off your mask. Further, you're with a bunch of vaccinated people with no symptoms and whatnot. Now you can take off your mask. So there are lots of opportunities. Oh, and as a last resort, you've got webcams for face-to-face -face interaction, not together interaction, but at least face-to-face -face in that sense. Also consider women in cultures who wear a hijab or a burqa. And so they, they're used to already having almost all their body covered except for their eyes. And in some cases, they'll just have these little slits where you can't even see their eyes. They're looking through this, this tinted thing. Is it the case that they lose their identity? Is it the case that they lose their connection with humanity and thereby their moral sense? I wouldn't think so, because if they did, they would lose the incentive to do all these things, I would think. Wouldn't that be counterproductive if that were the case? Further consider surgeons and sur surgical teams who spend their professional lives with a mask. I think it breaks, of course, but most of the days like this. Or scuba divers or painters that are always wearing a mask. So I, I don't, th those seem to be counterexamples. If it were the case that, we, that a virus were uh, so deadly and so contagious that we had to choose between either completely masking our entire face or instant painful death, then this argument would be more relevant. Then we would have to decide. Would we prefer to not be able to communicate facially whatsoever at any time at all? Or would we prefer to be dead? <laughs> and maybe not even the preference thing. It would just be, if we did this all the time, would that diminish our humanity? Now. I don't want to dismiss this argument because there definitely is something to the fact that wearing a mask does diminish our interactions, very much so. I'm sick of them. Everybody's sick of them. I want to be able to smile and laugh and hug and give my soccer players a high five. I want to hug them after a big play. Right now, all I can do is hug my own kids, and it's, uh, it's saddening, but that's the price we pay. At least we're not wearing masks when we're running around, which might be a little bit dangerous, but not as dangerous if we were indoors, I suppose. But there you go. Thank you, Qualic, for a very interesting argument. Note that he does close it out by saying, if my argument is true, then we need to get rid of masks. So he does leave open the possibility for criticism and whatnot. But this is a very helpful contribution. And thank you, Applied Ethicists. Keep doing your thing.